sono Fabio Petroni. I am Fabio Petroni, the program director of the Four Impact Foundation, a spin-off of the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart. And I am introducing the business model design course for the MicroVenture program. An entrepreneur has to be many things. He has to be a great leader, a visionary, an excellent manager and a great communicator. But above all, he has to be a man who is able to love. And in particular, he has to be able to love his customer. Because only in this way will he be able to generate value for the customer. The value that the entrepreneur generates for the customer through the product and the service he offers will be what pushes the customer to buy the product. In this course, we will therefore be looking to understand, first of all, who our customer is, secondly, what he considers to be a value, what his needs are, what his aspirations are, and how our products and our services must be designed, built, and structured to effectively meet this need or problem that the customer has. We will then build a business model on this, exploring the relationship that must be built with the customer, the channels through which we can distribute our product or our service and reach our customer, the activities and resources, the partnership that we need to have and develop so that our company's operation can generate this value for our customer, what costs we will face, what revenues we will be able to generate, and therefore the economic sustainability of our company. But the heart of our business model will always be our ability as entrepreneurs to satisfy a need or solve a problem for our customer and therefore generate value for him or her. Di generare valore per lui o per lei. The objective of this video lesson is to provide information about how to develop a business plan by preparing a business model. The business model shows how a company operates how it interacts with its customers and how it manages activities and costs to generate revenues. We will approach this topic using a classic model, the business model canvas by Alexander Osterwalder. Are you ready? Good, let's get started. The business model canvas is based on nine building blocks that entrepreneurs use to build their own company model. Let's take a look. First up is a value proposition block. What products and services are you offering your customers? In order to generate a value proposition, you need to accurately identify your customer's needs and so you must know which customer segments you will offer your product and services to. You must ask yourself, who am I generating value for? Who are my most important customers? And what are their main characteristics? At this point, you will have to work out which channels you can use to reach them. Customers relationships will be equally important. You will have to think about how to create, maintain and enhance your relationship with each of them. Then we will talk about revenues. What price are your customers willing to pay? And what resources do you need for your value proposition? What are the key activities that you must carry out to ensure your company is sustainable? What partners are strategic and why? What will be the most significant cost in your business model? Finally, we will look at the break-even point or when and how a company becomes sustainable. This video lesson will answer these and other questions point by point. The value proposition describes all of the products and services that create value for the customer. This is your promise to the customer, and it is one that you must never break. Simply put, it is everything that identifies you and makes you stand out from your competitors. Your value proposition meets a need or solves a problem for the customer. The more you are able to meet the customer's needs, the more your ideas will generate value. The degree to which the customer's needs are met by your product or service is called the product market fit. 
To reach a product market fit, it is essential not only to carefully analyze market demand, but also the products and services offered by the competition. We will return to them shortly. Think about your value proposition and devise your value declaration. Which customers is your company targeting? Customers are always central to your offering because, in the final analysis, they are the ones willing to invest money to obtain a response to a need or a problem they may have. You should therefore ask yourself what your customer profile is and what needs or problems they need to solve. The more your offering is able to satisfy the needs that you have identified, the more successful it will be. If we are not able to offer something that works for everyone, we should try to differentiate between different markets. In mass markets, consumption takes place on a large scale and the product or service offered does not need to be targeted specifically. Niche markets are very different, however, as they are aimed at a much smaller number of consumers with specific needs. Usually, competition between companies is very strong on the mass market, which is why new companies increasingly target market niches. A word of advice, a company's most important task, particularly during the startup phase, is to focus on the needs of customers with a suitable offering, which we referred to earlier as product market fit. In new companies or in companies with new products that are still unproven on the market, it is strategic to test your idea on early adopters. These are users you have access to like friends, neighbors or trailblazers who can give you immediate feedback on what it is like to use your product or service. Based on their answers, you can expand your offering or simply change the product or service. Not all ideas work, and the sooner we find this out, the better. Try to identify your customers and what needs your company can satisfy. Who could help you test your offering? Channels are the way your product or service reaches the customer and are the point of contact between the company and the consumers. Channels can be physical and therefore have a dedicated space like outlets, shops or supermarkets, or can be virtual. In this case, we mean online shops, which can be owned by the company, like the online shop section of your website, or supported by the third parties like Amazon or other virtual marketplaces. Channels can be direct and connect the company to the end customer, whether a consumer or a company, or can be indirect. In this case, it is good to have a series of stages managed by intermediaries. How will margins vary for your company? This will depend on the stages needed to reach the end customer. An artisan company making baked goods can sell directly to the consumer at his own bakery through a direct channel. The same company might want to expand its distribution activities to reach a larger market. In this case, it could use retailers capable of covering a larger area, sacrificing part of its profit margin but reaching more customers. As it grows even bigger, the bakery might want to start producing for mass consumption, using a wholesaler that buys in large quantities and then sells to large-scale distributors or retailers. In this case, the margin on individual products would be even lower in order to reach an even larger market. The choice of sales channels is based on different criteria. Firstly, efficiency, how to sell for the lowest possible price. Then, effectiveness, how can I sell to the largest number of customers? Next, we should consider quality to ensure that the product always reaches the end customer with the same characteristics. Control of distribution methods and times is just as important. And finally, we must pay attention to convenience to make it easier for the customer to access the product or service. What channels will you adopt for your company?
In this session, we will look at customer relationships. The type of relationship you establish and develop will determine the customer's experience of your company. Let's look at some strategies for acquiring, maintaining and expanding your customer portfolio. In the acquisition phase, customers do not yet know you. You can generate demand by advertising, for example, on the radio, TV, newspapers and social media or by taking part in trade fairs and events that are more expensive but that allow you to have direct contact with your customers. Online communities like blogs, Facebook and mailing lists, as well as word of mouth with contacts like friends and family are all effective ways of establishing customer relationships. One method that requires a lot of work but that gives great result is the new possibility for brand positioning through collaborations with influencers and product testimonials. During the customer retention phase, you have already established a relationship with the customer and you want to maintain it. The most useful strategies include improving the product or innovating to avoid being left out of the market. Loyalty programs such as collecting points, travel packages or discounts on theater tickets when purchasing a product. Personalized support like a customer support center and suggestions on customer satisfaction. During the growth phase, your objective is to increase your sales volume. The most useful strategies include upselling. When a customer buys a product, you suggest they buy a similar one. For example, offer a discount if they buy a larger bottle of detergent. Cross-selling. When a customer buys a product, you suggest they also buy a complementary product. Upselling and cross-selling combined account for 35% of sales on Amazon, which gives an idea of how important these methods are. Finally, with viral marketing, you offer a discount to customers who bring in new customers. Which of these strategies will you use to acquire, maintain and expand your customer base? The key activities are the activities your company must carry out to function and achieve the objectives established in your value proposition. They relate directly to the company's human and financial resources and the partners needed to carry them out. Startup activities depend on the sector you are operating in and may, for example, include the purchase of a site and product machinery, the lease or purchase of warehouses, hiring personnel and acquiring licenses or patents. Estimates of startup costs will tell you the size of the initial investments. Operating activities are activities that your company must carry out once it is up and running, for example, procurement, sales, research and development. Your company will not necessarily have to carry out all of these activities itself. Outsourcing to competent, qualified third parties can significantly reduce your investment costs. The decision to carry out tasks internally or make use of partners or suppliers depends on a series of variables. Firstly, the nature of your company. If you develop innovative software, there is a risk that suppliers will copy your ideas, in which case it is a good idea to keep that department in-house. Secondly, you have to consider the market demand variable. If we are in an exploration phase, it may be smarter to acquire an external service rather than incur the cost of doing it ourselves. In general, acquiring services and outsourcing parts of your production process to partners is always cheap, but it should not put your company at risk. What are your company's key activities? A company's key resources are directly linked to the activities it carries out and make it possible to identify the costs of the business plan. These may be tangible sources such as structures like warehouses, the workshop, furniture, equipment such as computers and machinery, and everything purchased for transformation, for example, raw material. 
intangible resources, such as the company's technological expertise, parents' experience and know-how, reputation, brand, intellectual property, customer portfolio, relationships, and the company culture, to name but a few. Human resources, meaning the company's human capital, employees, engineers, and sales staff, and their respective skills. Financial resources, meaning the funds available to the company, which may come from the entrepreneur's own capital, from crowdfunding, banks, and investors, or friends and family. Once you have identified your company's key activities, you will be able to calculate the resources you need and then establish any partnership with other organizations. What resources does your company need? Partnerships are strategic for companies as they help achieve economic results, raise their profile and have an impact at a low cost. Partners are external organizations that may help you to be successful in various ways. They can be suppliers, complementary companies in the same production chain, or competitors with which you establish a mutual support agreement. Partnership must be very well defined by agreements covering formal and informal expectations. With key suppliers, the agreement is usually fairly informal as it is a simple supply contract. It becomes more formal when you want to ensure exclusivity or any degree of protection of your company's know-how. Unstructured informal collaborations may be established with complementary companies. Customers will receive benefits and discounts and your companies will thereby enjoy a greater market share. Then there are traffic partners who support each other by posting links to their partner's site on their own website. Strategic alliances may be established between complementary companies or between competitors, in which case it is known as coopetition. For example, two competing manufacturing companies that join forces to withstand the arrival of a business giant in their country. Finally, let's take a look at joint ventures. In this case, two complementary or competing companies decide to open a jointly owned business. The structure of this sort of cooperation must be well defined, with an agreement that sets out mutual roles and responsibilities, the capital to be invested and the methods for accessing the market and sharing profits. Remember that partnership must always adopt a win-win strategy that benefits both organizations. Have you already identified which partners you will need and who you may be able to form strategic alliances with? Now we must look at the company's cost structure. We have seen the strategic steps that lead us to determine the key activities and what we need to do in order to maintain our commitment to the value proposition. Now let's take a look at how to organize our company and its costs. As a company owner, you will have to manage fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs are those that do not change when there are changes to the quantity produced or sold. For example, during the startup phase, a restaurant may have to buy or lease a space for the kitchen and dining area as well as tables and chairs. It may hire a cook and a waiter. Regardless of the number of meals served, the fixed cost will always be the same. Examples of fixed costs are leases, wages, administrative costs, insurance and telephone charges. Variable costs are proportionate to the quantity of merchandise or goods produced and sold. In our restaurant example, this item will include raw materials for making meals, any additional waiting staff for special occasions, or even electricity consumption. It is important to try to transform fixed costs into variable costs as far as possible, particularly during the startup phase to enable the company to be flexible, especially during periods of market uncertainty. Just as strategic when possible to lease machinery rather than buy it. 
Total costs are the sum of fixed costs and variable costs. Have you already estimated the fixed and variable costs for your company? What revenue streams could your company secure? A company's revenues are calculated as the difference between its incomings and outgoings. The revenue model is the company's strategy for generating income for each customer segment. It is fundamental to identify all possible sources of revenue, which must be varied and preferably distinct. There are various types of revenue streams. Physical sources are linked to the sale of the physical goods, leases and rent. Virtual sources are linked to sales of online services or applications, such as signups for games or subscriptions. Finally, there are subsidies, which means various sorts of funding from public or private sources. Let's look at an example. If you have a farmhouse that you operate as a guest house, your first revenue streams comes from providing accommodation to guests. In the off-season, you may not get many bookings. In this case, it might be strategic to make your spaces available for company conventions or create packages for schools and interest in organizing school trips to natural surroundings. You could also offer organized services like bicycle trips or local excursions. These are three additional revenue streams on top of your core business. How is the sale price of a product or service calculated? The strategies to be used vary based on market capacity. How unique your value proposition is and what your competitors are doing. Under the cost-based strategy, the price is calculated based on the cost production and will be a multiple of that. Value pricing is based on the value that the customer attributes to the product. For example, the value of the status resulting from purchasing the product. With competitive pricing, the price is chosen in relation to the prices charged by competitors. The volume pricing strategy involves setting a price that encourages multiple purchases and which will therefore be lower if large volumes are purchased. Finally, affordable pricing is a price formulation strategy that involves a base amount from the customer and an additional part from public or private subsidies. To understand how to set the right price, it is essential to carefully evaluate the price you are asking and how much your customer is willing to pay. Think about what revenue streams your company can access and then start setting prices for your products or services. Now we have reached the section on the break-even point. Entrepreneurs need to analyze their break-even point to understand the sales volume they need within a certain period in order to achieve economic sustainability and evaluate a product's profitability. Revenue over and above the break-even point constitutes the company's profit margin. Now let's start with your company. You will have defined the key activities, the necessary resources, and how much they cost, the partners and suppliers to work with, the revenue streams and methods and the price, and you will have determined your fixed and variable costs. To understand the break-even point, we have to introduce two key concepts. The production unit. When we calculate costs, we need a reference. For example, Georgette opened a well-being center that sells beauty treatments. She leased a professional machine for treatments and hired a specialized beautician. Since Georgette knows how many treatments the machine can provide each day, she will use this information to calculate the cost of treatment per hour. The sales unit. The sales unit is the package that you choose to sell the customer. In the case of Georgette Beauty Saloon, the sales unit is a 30-minute session at a cost of 25 euros. To calculate the break-even point, we need to know the fixed and variable cost per sales unit and our maximum production capacity, and we have to establish a price for the sales unit. 
The break-even point helps us to understand whether our price is right and if we need to change anything. Let's look at an example. We'll return to our beauty salon. Every week, Georgette pays 30 euros for advertising, 50 euros for insurance, 30 euros for bills, and 250 euros in wages. But each treatment also has variable costs that have to be added. 10 euros for renting the machine and 5 euros for maintenance and 1 euro for phone calls for booking each session. Georgette sets the price for each 30-minute treatment at 25 euros and her beauty salon has a maximum capacity of 60 treatments a week. How many treatments does she have to book in order to reach the break-even point? If we add all of the fixed costs, we get 360 euros in expenses per week. Now let's add the variable costs. 16 euros per session. To see how many treatments she must sell to reach the break-even point, Georgette will have to calculate the unit contribution margin, meaning how much she is left from the sales of the treatment to cover variable costs. In our case, 25 minus 16 equals 9 euros per treatment. Now we can calculate our break-even point, which will be given by dividing total fixed costs by the unit contribution margin. Georgette will have to sell at least 40 treatments per week to reach the break-even point. If Georgette's maximum production capacity is 60 treatments per week, once she has sold the 40 treatments that she needs to cover her costs, the remaining 20 treatments will be the beauty salon's profit margin. Let's imagine Georgette's fixed costs increase because wages go up to 440 euros. What will the beauty salon's new break-even point be? 61 treatments, which is beyond maximum capacity. This would mean the beauty salon would not break even and she might try making wages cost variable. For example, by asking if the beautician will agree to work on occasional basis. Let's imagine Georgette faces pressures from her competitors and has to lower her prices from 25 euros to 22 per treatment. What happens to the break-even point? At a price of 22 euros with the same variable cost, the unit contribution margin is 6 euros. To reach the break-even point, the beauty salon would have to sell 60 treatments, which is the maximum capacity without the possibility of earning any profit. In this case, Georgette would have to try to cut her costs, otherwise her company would not be sustainable. Before signing off, let's summarize the key concepts of the business model. 1. The business model canvas is divided into various building blocks, the first of which relates to the importance of knowing the customer's needs and knowing how to provide a winning response through the value proposition. 2. We have seen how to acquire, maintain and expand our market through customers' relationship strategies and partnership with other companies. 3. We have looked at the strategic importance of distribution channels, which can be physical, virtual, direct, and indirect. 4. A company's key activities allow us to understand which resources and partners we will need, helping us to calculate our costs. 5. The section on revenue streams showed how important it is to think about different revenue solutions from the same product or service. 6. In the last section, we used a practical example to see how to calculate the break-even point and what problems can arise when there are changes in costs and market conditions. All of these concepts will be essential for drawing up your business plan. Discover how in the Doing Business Manual that you can find on the website of the International Organization for Migration, IOM, at www.italy.iom.int We'll leave you with an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. This is to remind you of the importance of knowing how to put together a team that you can work with productively in a way that meets your company's needs.